Hi, everybody. Dr. Daniel. Today I'm talking about the do's and don't of migraine management. Well, the first thing to consider here is that persons with migraine, which is going to be 26% of all women and about 6% of men, are born with a special brain, a migraine brain. And this brain is sensitive to a lot of different items and will react to give you a headache. And these things are sleep, sleeping too much or not sleeping enough, to different smells. I've had patients who tell me they walk into a fabric store, which is a lot of unusual smells in there, and they get a migraine right at that moment. The migraine brain reacts to lights, like flashing lights or um, sunlight um, bleeding in their eyes. They can react to different loud noises. They can react to eating or la lack of eating, missing a meal. They can react to stress, can give you a headache, or get them really freedom from stress, or what's called a letdown headache. Those are also called, in migraine talk, they're called Saturday morning, Sunday morning, weekend headache or vacation headaches. Uh, you can also have headaches uh, that relate to menstrual cycles, particularly for women when they have that once a month. So that's, that's the outline of the brain and person with migraine and how they react to different things. And the migraine lifestyle is devised to try to work around this so you don't get the headaches. So you eat regularly, you exercise regularly, set your sleep cycle, you avoid loud noises best you can, and bright lights, wear sunglasses and things like that. So considering this, I'm gonna now pause, pose some questions for migraine patients. Why do not migraine patients treat with prescription drugs? Well, something like 25, 30% of persons with migraine, it's not bad. It's a migraine we could consider it to be mild, moderate, or severe, so they have very mild migraine. And they don't work, or they're at home, so they're not in a job or an office or something like that. So they could have their migraine start up, they could take two aspirin, go to bed, take a nap, and wake up, and the headache's gone. There's something about sleep that kind of resets the brain and gets rid of a migraine. But most of us can't live like that. We have jobs, responsibilities, places we have to be, and so we are not able to do that. However, if you take one of the triptans, and there are seven triptans that are available, five of them really for acute onset, and two of those uh, injectable sumatriptan, six milligrams subcutaneously, and nasal spray, zolmatriptan, they work quicker and probably the best drugs for acute therapy of the triptan group. They can give a 70-80% uh, headache-free experience for most people with migraine if they take it at onset and treat quickly. Now the other problem with migraine patients is that first treatment of the drug doesn't always work and they have to try different drugs and to kind of rotate through that working with their doctor and talking on the phone or coming back into the office to visit and redo that. So then if the patient with migraine uh, has maybe three or four migraines a month, they ought to start considering the doctor might want to mention on the follow-up visit that they get on a preventive drug. In the old days, those were drugs like topiramate and Depakote, which are anticonvulsants that also approved for treating migraine. They could take consider to take amitriptyline, which is an old-timey antidepressant drug at low dose, really works well for sleep and migraine management. Or they could try a beta blocker called propranolol, which is works for heart irregularities and blood pressure management. But the thing is, only about 40% of patients will take a preventive drug, and so most persons with migraine are not doing that. And if they take one, they have to rotate through it to find the ones that work. Now, in the last several years, we've had these new CGRP um, drugs that are antibodies that block the release of CGRP, which is an inflammatory chemical that comes out in the migraine process. And the CGRP chemical kind of inflames the trigeminal nerve, the artery, and the thalamus in the brain that set off the migraine. So now we have triptans that could completely block that process. We have drugs that work within the interstices in the metabolic processing of migraine itself to block the reagent there. And that's been available since about 1991 when sumatriptan first came out. And so persons, even with mild migraine, this disabling uh, that's caused you know, to miss time out and just be in bed sleeping, or they get nauseated and vomit, uh, I think those patients really should probably consider being on a triptan. You know, as you age, you have to go see doctors. Uh, a lot of people don't want to do that, particularly men. Women will see doctors for men will in general. 
But if you're dealing with migraine, you have this problem, you're going to have to deal with it in your life. I would recommend these people consider seeing a doctor and getting on one of the tryptin drugs. They may have to ask for it in the doctor's office. And in the past, uh, insurance companies have done things like limiting the use of drugs so they would make the patient take like a painkiller like Tylenol, Advil, or Excedrin or something for a couple of migraines and see if they fail that before they would let them try one of the uh, acute therapy drugs. They've done the same thing in the past with the old uh, drugs for migraine therapy. They're doing the same things nowadays with the use of CGRP drugs. you got to fail the old preventive drugs so you can get on one of the new drugs, uh, the CGRP drugs. And also in 2020, there are three different drugs that came out that are new and different drugs for treating migraine. But those drugs are name brand and they're expensive and that they can be used, but if you don't have insurance, that can be really expensive. And I've heard that Nurtec, which is one of those drugs, new drugs 2020, it could cost up to $1,000 a, a year just for providing therapy for that medication. So the other thing is uh, migraine patients have this complicated medical problem. And I personally feel that the patient in the office with the doctor needs a lot of explanation, uh, probably sometimes show graphs, have them read some things to uh, answer questions and try to get feedback to answer these kind of questions. And I've heard of headache practices in America where the main doctor would see the patient once for the new patient visit because they get paid higher for that and they won't see the patient back for another year, which to me doesn't seem like really good medical care. And that headache practice will farm the patient out to PAs or nurse practitioners who know a lot about headache, but they're not the doctor for the next year or so. So that's a problem sometimes. Another thing to consider is that all drugs have possible side effects, but something like the tryptans have now been out about 30 years, and we know what the side effects are of those drugs, and they're, they're okay, and you have to live with it and kind of work around it, but they're certainly better than a disabling migraine that puts you down in bed that makes you kind of vomit. And also, uh, the preventive drugs in the past, um, like amitriptyline, propranolol, all that group, Side effects are well known there, and the new drugs, the CGRP drugs, are really remarkably better regarding side effects, and they don't have any interference with the other drug as uh, some of the older drugs would, would have. Okay, the next question would be, why do successful persons with migraine follow the neurologist's advice for lifestyle and medication treatment? Well, the reason is they found that that really works for them, and they feel better, and they feel like they're able to control their migraines and by doing that to control their life. So basically doing the migraine lifestyle is a, a, a given that should be done for all patients with migraine. And briefly to review that again, that's uh, eating three meals a day, trying to get seven or eight hours sleep at night, setting your sleep-wake cycle to get up at the same time and go to bed every night. I know the world's full of kind of things. I got five kids. I know it's like things happen and people get sick in the night or you have to go on holiday and things. But in general, your schedule would be seven or eight hours a night of sleep at night. Um, you would try to limit caffeine or probably get off of caffeine because caffeine is the number one drug in America, according to the American Migraine Association, that aggravates or provokes migraine to be more frequent or severe. And you would watch out for your triggers. People will find out what their triggers are. Some people react to barometric pressure. They'll react to heat, like a hot, sunny day, need a hat or stay in air conditioning until after 4 o'clock in Texas because it gets really hot out there. To avoid uh, fasting, so you're eating three meals a day. You know, women at the time of their menstrual cycle have to take it really uh, carefully during that time because they likely have headaches during the, then, and the headaches they have during their cycle are the worst ones they have. All right, the other thing I want to talk about is just headache in general in the United States. So. Um, 99% of headaches that people get are either tension type headaches or migraine. And the figures there are something like 70% of headaches are tension type headaches and 30% of migraine. In the migraine group, about 30% of migraine headaches are migraine with aura, where they have a visual aura usually before the headache starts or sometime in the middle of the headache. Or they may have tingling that goes up an arm to the face. They may have trouble talking. Although that's a pretty rare occurrence in migraine. The most common migraine with aura, aura is to have the visual images of seeing spots or holes or zigzag lines or something like that. And then about half of patients with migraine will have menstrual headaches. As I mentioned before earlier, the menstrual headaches are really some of the worst headaches people get, women get. 
So like 12% of the world population get migraine. And um, migraine is an extremely disabling condition also. I have blog articles and also the video, videos on YouTube about the migraine lifestyle. If you want to look at that, it's more detailed view of that than I will give right at this moment. So patients with migraine really need to learn to live with it. Uh, the other problem is I've read that something like 56% of patients who have migraine have never had a diagnosis made by a doctor. Wow. So let me just spend a minute on that. So tension type headache, I said, is the most frequent kind of headache. And tension type headache can be a headache that's mild or moderate, but it's certainly not severe. So if we use a scale of 1 to 10 uh, severity, so tension type headache goes about 5. Tension type headache is a tight, squeezing feeling, usually the temples can be in the back of the neck and the jaw area. Um, these people are not allowed to have nausea or vomiting or sensitivity to light or sound as part of it. And usually tension headaches on both sides of the head and not one side. So migraine early, uh, easily said, migraine could be said to be a one-sided headache. No one really knows why, but they use a one-sided head. Many patients will say, like, well, headaches are right-sided most of the time. Every now and then I have one on the left. Sometimes in the headache, they'll switch to the right to the left side. Well, that's reassuring. That's saying that's this genetic neurochemical problem with migraine, but it's not a brain tumor or an aneurysm on the right side of your brain. And patients with migraine should be worked up with scanning and see their neurologists and stuff like that. I'm not saying that. But again, that history of switching sides is reassuring. But migraine may be one-sided. All right. It's throbbing in nature because the arteries dilate. The chemicals come out and inflame the artery. Migraines make you nauseated or lose your appetite. Um, sometimes they make you vomit. They make you not want to stand up or be up. You want to go to bed and lie down with them. The patient may, during the migraine, be sensitive to light, sound, and odors. So those are the features of migraine. That migraine is also has a bunch of names they're called, which are really kind of misnomers for migraine, like they're called sinus headache. Well, really, sinus headache is not in the International Classification of Headache Disorder, which is the Bible for headache. Sinus headache is your migraine, and that was introduced by the Sudafed industry in America on TB sets in the 50s, because Sudafed is a weak vasoconstrictor, uh, like caffeine is, and migraine has vasodilatation or expansion of the arteries in the brain during the headache and drugs like Sudafed will cause vasoconstriction and help it to some degree. So migraine is called hungry headache, menstrual headache, let down a headache, nocturnal headache, weekend headache, and all those kinds of things. Next thing you consider is how stress and pressure, just life events can impact on migraine. If you look at a list of triggers that have been reported by many doctors throughout the year, that's articles about that. Stress is always up there at the very top. A lot of patients come in the office, they want to talk about food choices and things like that, which is at the bottom of the list of things that aggravate migraine. So many times I'll talk about stress with patients and they don't expect a lot of inquiries from a non-psychiatry doctor uh, about stress in their life in that regard, although it's most important so I'm talking about it now. And so I get the feeling from talking to them that the stress relates to somebody else, but not to me, where all of us has a, some degree of stress. We need to deal with it. I remember years ago uh, counting up the stress issues with a patient um, who didn't agree with me, and she left the office kind of in a huff. And I was lucky that several weeks ago, this didn't happen very often, she called back and said, you know, I got a book on stress, and I, I have, you were right. I had top stress issues, a lot of things you were talking about. So thank you very much. And um, that doesn't happen to me very often, but I'm glad it did it that one time. But I would stress to you on this uh, video that that's a really important thing. So stress can be uh, taking grades in school if you're in college. Uh, it's uh, interfaces of going from high school to college or going to a job or a workforce, uh, getting married, um, having the birth of ch children, having stress in someone in your life, a loved one, your mom or dad, a brother or sister, a child or somebody sick. Um, in hospital. I can remember seeing migraine patients throughout the years who would have be working, have several kids, their parents would be in a hospital with a stroke and they'd be down at the hospital, you know, a devoted child, uh, even at that age, um, every day for like two months. And that's extremely stressful for people to go through that. So um, loss of job or a new job, things like that can be very stressful. 
So we ought to really create a lifestyle for ourselves with people that we can talk to about things. And that's usually our spouse. If not so, it could be a good friend or sibling, someone in the family, someone you trust. Sometimes a, a mentor in the work role can solve that for you. For religious people, it could be a priest, a preacher, a rabbi, or a counselor, or someone like that, that you can bounce your ideas off of to get some in, important information about yourself and help deal with it. And in general, we need to talk about these things in our lives. So next, I'm going to mention and talk about medication over his headache, because this is the most important thing. If you read the books and articles written on that, they say it's uh, something like 3 to 4% of the total population on Earth. But I'll bet you it's higher than that, because most patients are not a research, you know, research group and reported. Because if you do headaches, something like 99% of new patients come in your door are going to have medication over his headache. 80 to 90% of new patients have medication over his headache. This used to be called rebound headache, but the current name from the International Classification of Headache Disorders is uh, medication over use headache. And the words says what they're talking about there. So that organization has stated regarding over-the-counter medications, Tylenol, Advil, uh, caffeine, um, naproxen, those are called non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and doctors call them NSAIDs. Any one of those drugs in that group, if you take one of them 15 days a month and you've got migraine, you're at risk for possibly getting medication or use headache. I'll talk about how that happens in a minute. If you use triptans, you get 10 days treatment a month. But if you take more than that, you could possibly get headache from it. And of course, no doctor, no patient should take an opiate narcotic for treatment of migraine. Those days are gone and in the past. Uh, we're having such trouble with people dying from opiate narcotics in the world now anyway. And so, and you should know also that tramadol is an opiate narcotic. Well, a lot of people and doctors don't know that. But I'm talking about hydrocodone, morphine, and stuff like that. So they have no place in management outpatient headache practice. And of course, butalbital drugs, which is in Fioridol or SJEC, they're the worst drugs in the world. Um, they've been banned in every country in the world except Canada, the United States. We cannot get legislators to ban it here in America because it causes the medication to reset it. So even if you were to take those, if you take one of those 10 days a month, you could get a headache from that. The reason that happens is because migraine is a process in the brain and it can last from 4 to 72 hours. During that time, these inflammatory chemicals come out that are in the brain. They come down the jugular vein. They're metabolized. They go to your liver and they go out in the toilet. The whole thing can take about three days, two or three days or something like that. But if you keep taking medication, like you've got a headache, migraine, and you're taking 400, 500 milligrams of caffeine every day from your Starbucks uh, hits that you're getting, and you have a migraine, you take your two sumatriptan to treat it, but you're still taking caffeine every day. Some people will pick up it right there and they'll start getting medication over his headache, mainly because your brain doesn't have enough time to clear these neurochemicals out. It's going to happen over 72 hours. And every time you keep taking another painkiller, Tylenol, Advil, caffeine, another tryptin, <clears throat> it gives you three more days of these neurochemicals. The process just keeps going on. It's like you're putting fire on, I'm sorry, putting kerosene on a fire on help patients or something like that. So avoid medication of use headache. The other thing, what should you do is you plan this out. What should I do when I have a migraine? So the Boy Scout motto was always be prepared. And so you always should carry your trip to drugs with you wherever you go, uh, in the car or in, in your pocket, in your suit pocket, or women in their purses. There's just really no excuse not to treat it at onset. It's important that you do that. A lot of people make a mistake in that they'll take caffeine or Excedra and a couple of Tylenol. So the headache starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. And they'll take it then. And they don't take the trip until 9.30 or 10 o'clock because it's got to be so awful. And it's level 10 there. It's disabling and they're getting nauseated. And then the triptans will work any time during the course of a migraine to bring it down something. You are not going to have a headache-free period of time in two hours. So it would be if you took your trip at 8 o'clock, you should be headache-free by 10 o'clock in about 78% of persons. You should always treat first using a triptan. And you have to weed through the different triptans and be sure you find the ones that work with you. Again, that's dealing with your doctor to do that. The other thing you can do at the start of a migraine is be sure you're not dehydrated. 
if you are, you can take some fluids with that, like water. People carry water bottles, these little plastic things in cars and everywhere we go nowadays. So it's pretty easy to get fluids. Um, you might try to find a cool, quiet, dark place. Maybe you could lie down or just lean back in a chair, put your feet up for a period of time, 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes over lunch, people can do that um, to deal with the migraine so you can get rid of it and treat it, hopefully get through it. And finally, I think it would be helpful for you to keep a migraine diary and you can get uh, several, there's several migraine free apps on the internet you can put on the cell phone. I have a blog article about that. If you want to go to drmigraine.com and look around, you can see that. And that, if you chart headaches for a period of time, even a couple of months, you bring it in and show your doctor, but also it'd be a learning experience. You can see that you had a headache when you didn't eat a meal or uh, stayed up late on Saturday night or something like that will help you to know what your triggers are. You learn them by looking at your diaries. So God bless all you folks with migraine. I hope this talk's been helpful to you. Please click on like down there and I will see you again on the next talk.